One of the things we love about Carver and the world loves about Carver is not only was he the great scientist, he was pioneer. He had a pioneering spirit and he had a servant's heart. Our speaker today, Dr. Goldie S. Bird, has demonstrated her acumen as a scientist, her pioneering spirit, and a servant's heart. Last night, a few of us had the pleasure and opportunity to have brief conversations with her. I asked a question after looking at her resume, why aren't you a president of a university? We need people with your track record and resumes. And as intelligent as she is, she totally avoided my question. <laughs> she plunged into what she wanted to talk about. And when you look at your programs, there's a lot on there that's spoken about her, but she launched into the Center for Outreach and Alzheimer's Aging and Community Health. And her passion, as she talked about it, lifted the room. It was like, wow, we were taken to another place. And critical that, to that was science to serve the African-American population in particular, and to do it from within a community base. And when she put all that together with the integrative and interdisciplinary components, it was like, wow, this is just what the world needs to hear, and certainly HBCUs, and certainly a message at Tuskegee University. Now, for you who are out there as scientists and want to question her credentials, well, when you look at all her presentations and publications and $65 million in grants, you can say, okay, she's qualified, yes. And you look further at her awards and all her board and committee appointments at the national and state level, you say, yes. Those are exemplary qualifications that demonstrate a career of excellence. I also want to point out three more things. Number one, her education was at HBCUs. So here we have a successful genius who served and had an exemplary career and went to North Carolina A&T, Meharry. Of course, she did some postgraduate work at other renowned universities. But you who are working on your bachelor's, master's, PhDs, DVMs, et cetera, here, MPH at Tuskegee University, you're getting the best. And you're gonna hear from an uh, exemplar of that in a few minutes. The second thing was family. Nothing about her family is listed in her bio, but if she chooses, she'll share that with you. What a fascinating story. What a fascinating family. She found a way to put it all together and, and live a balanced life as a scientist, as a mother, and, and as a community leader. And then lastly, I cannot be through with her. I just keep insisting her personality and power and, and science leadership. We have to find a way at Tuskegee University to keep the com conversation going. She is a master communicator. And we have to instill that within our students, and we have to learn to be that better amongst ourselves. Communication is key. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Goldie S. Bird. Good morning, Tuskegee. Good morning. I want to thank Dean Hill for that really wonderful introduction. And you're right, my family and my God are my strength. And I don't deny that. I guess I shared the bio that I have to share sometimes when I can't say things like that. But I am so delighted to be here this morning. President Morris, faculty, staff, students, invited guests, and all of you. It is my great pleasure to stand here today. 
I just couldn't be more filled with this occasion. I want to especially thank President Morris for the invitation to come. But not only that, I, I want to just thank you for your warm hospitality. As you know, presidents have long days, day after day. And after a long day yesterday, she invited us over for dinner to chat and to get to know each other. And then she has a very long day today. And so as I get older and more wise, I appreciate good hospitality. I like it when people take care of me. And I was taken care of from the time I received her letter to Robin's emails to her reminders from when I was picked up by the officer last night and looking out and making sure I was checked in. I like that. I just like it. And it's that spirit of giving and helping that we celebrate today the 19th convocation to observe the life and legacy of Dr. George Washington Carver. It's always great to be on the campus, but this is the first time that I lived in the same building that he lived in. What an honor for me to be here and to engage. I am so proud to be humbly associated, that sounds like an oxymoron, with the people who have stood here to help you observe this giant of a person. As with all historically black colleges, there's so much history, there's so much legacy, but I can tell you the depth and breadth of history that has truly changed America and the world. This university stands out. When its founder brought in Dr. George Washington Carver, the university changed. There's so much to know, so many people who've contributed so much. You know, when we think of Tuskegee, we think of Tuskegee Airmen. We think of famous artists, the Commodores. We think of Tom Joyner, many, many alumni. In the scientific community, when we say Tuskegee, we think of the, Tuske the notorious Tuskegee syphilis experiment. So much has changed because of this city and this university. So as we remember this person who started with such a small light, grew into a huge, huge light, the intentionality of this university to remember, to make sure that our students remember from freshman to senior, to make sure that we know what the legacy is and not just what he did, but who he was and what he represented. This prominent scientist, educator, mentor, advocate, inventor, and for me, most importantly, humanitarian. He's remembered by not only Tuskegee, but all across the land. And he really exemplifies so much of what we really want to be in America. So today I'm going to call him Dr. George Washington Carver. And in his humble way, he really didn't want to be called Dr. George Washington Carver because he didn't have that terminal degree as we know it, but he had honorary degrees. And he thought that was just making too much fuss over him. And he didn't want people to misunderstand. So as we know, um, again, during his academic time here, he was a teacher and a scholar, and he did all those things in the department that department chairs do. You know, I can imagine he had a lot of reports. He had to assign classes. He had to do annual reports. You know, Olga, all those things that we have to do. But he was much more than that. 
because his vision extended far beyond the walls of that department. He advanced ideals for mankind, and he wasn't afraid to go out into the community. He had a vision for the next generation of students, like many of the chairs sitting in this room. But he also had a vision for those outside of the classroom, for farmers, for people who were disenfranchised, for people who had less and who knew less. Oh my, this is what universities are supposed to be about. So he did this work, and he did it with such enthusiasm, with such vision, with such profound achievement, such excellence, that we continue to celebrate year after year. Now, if some of us had achieved what Dr. Carver achieved, we would be hard to handle. We would want that handle on our name. We would want everybody to know who we are. But he was a very humble spirit, and he didn't want us to get off track worrying about him or his accolades. He didn't want to file a lot of patents, Dr. Morris. We'll talk about that later. He probably would under your leadership. He would file those patents. He didn't want people worrying about the things that don't make a lot of difference, like the way he dressed. So people, some people, you know how we talk. Some people thought he was a little shabby to be on the campus. So let's just dig a little bit more deeply. It seems that Dr. Carver was a master for overcoming adversity. Now, approximately 153 years ago, he was born into slavery. Now, slavery, as we all know it, was brutal in our history. I understand in the good state of Alabama that someone recently said that America was great when slavery was around, that at least families were together. I'm glad I didn't come that week. <laughs> that was not a good time, and that was not when America was at its greatest. I'm sure that the Carver family and countless others would agree to that. Families were torn, torn apart, just as in the case of the family of Dr. Carver. You see, he was born to parents who were torn apart by one, his father's accidental death, and then secondly, by a ravaged consequence of slavery. As the story goes, Dr. Carver was born a slave in about 1864 in Diamond Grove, Missouri. His parents, Mary and Giles Carver, because that was the name of their owners, who were Moses and Susie Carver. The story is told that about a week after George's death, raiders from Arkansas kidnapped him, his mother and his sister, and the three were sold in Kentucky. Now, this is right around the time of Emancipation Proclamation. Of the three of them, only George was located by Carver's agent and returned to his original owner. He never saw his mother again and his sister. That was not when America was at its greatest. Now students, imagine you're a baby and your mother and your sister are taken and you never see them again. Your dad is dead too. So here you are without the support of your mother, your father, your sisters and your brothers and you have to navigate this life. Now this is about the time when this, the slavery was on paper was over, ended. The Carvers, however, decided to keep George and his brother James. With no parents, thank God, they raised the two boys and educated them. But they educated them at home, guess why? Because these black boys at that time were not to be accepted by schools. And George was a sickly fellow. We called it in the country, he was puny. He was a puny fella, so he didn't do much work in the fields, but guess what? He loved plants. He loved arts. And isn't it amazing when we bring disciplines together? And that's what that was about, bringing disciplines together. I'm not even sure when he was about 12, he even knew that. And students, that's what you do every day. 
You bring disciplines together, formally or informally. And that's what we as faculty do as well. So when he left home about, about 10, and he went to a school about 10 miles away, his name was changed from Carver's George to George Carver. Now imagine that you do not carry your parents' names and the indignity that you or someone else's Mary or James or Kendra or John or Jane or Kendra or John. You're someone else's James. Kendra, or John. So he attended school. He just kept going. Somehow, he just kept going. But before he received, um, he went to several schools before he received a diploma. And I can only imagine the feelings of rejection, the feeling of isolation, the feeling of confusion. And this was a turbulent time in our history. When he was accepted to Highland College in, in Kansas, he was unable to attend there. Because when they found out his color, they said what? No. Now mind you, this was post-slavery. Just like sometimes now people say we are post-racial. Rejection, disenfranchisement, feeling isolated. Alone. I hear students saying that today on our campus. I feel that way sometimes. But just like George Washington Carver, we must push on. We must push forward. Life can be daunting. Sometimes our students find ourselves in the most uncomfortable situations. Sometimes our families are broken physically or spiritually. Sometimes we find ourselves on the street on our campus. Sometimes our situations are dire, and the question becomes, what is it inside of us that keeps us going? Countless times we're told no. Countless times we feel insecure. And if you haven't had the experience of being like George Carver, when he went to Iowa to school, or being the only one, just live on. One day, you will be the only one on a board in a meeting, in a circumstance, in a classroom. My hope for you is that you will find deep down inside that will to keep going in spite of, and as President Obama used to say, say yes, I can. Yes, we can. So in so many ways, we, we continue to be polarized and separated and unequal. I'm, just, I'm excited about Dr. Morris, your only female president. Give her a hand. Yes. You're still so many firsts. I remember being the first female chair of biology, the first permanent dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And without fail, women continue to be first far too often. And that's just one example of what we have to do to make sure that we are providing equity, not just equality, but equity, and vice versa. We have to make sure, students, this will be your lot as you take on our roles as faculty and leaders in a global society. We know that racism and sexism and all kinds of isms continue to exist. But like Dr. Carver, we push forward. We make the best of circumstances. Secondly, Dr. Carver had a thirst, as someone mentioned already, for lifelong learning as a boy. He was not the, the most bulky guy. He didn't do all of that hard work, but he certainly worked his head. He worked his brain even at 12 and 13 years of age. And it's amazing how he integrated life life's experiences with academia, with prominence, with personality. And he did say, and I, I will read this again, from a child he had this inordinate desire for knowledge and painting and flowers and sciences. He wanted to know every stone. Now that's a different kind of learning than learning for the quiz or learning for the test. That is a deeper learning. That is an excitement about learning. 
So yeah, he was the, he was the first black student at, at, at Iowa State College, and yes, that must have been an ordeal. We know it was an ordeal. But fear and intimidation did not get in the way of his dreams and his visions. Somehow, and without the encouragement of a birth parent or a birth sister or brother, except one, he continued to push forward. What was it? What was it about Dr. Carver? Where was that thing, that gut thing, that says, in spite of, I push forward? Where is that today? And that is the thing that we all have to find, that inner passion, that inner desire to move forward and to make such a difference. He had wonderful mentors, though. And so to my faculty colleagues, we have to be better mentors. We have to help our students and be advocates for them. And I know that you do. But I have often wondered about that thing that kept him going on such dire circumstances. An ardent student, and he stayed on after he received his master's, I believe, in plant pathology, and was invited to be a faculty member. And then on to Tuskegee Institute. I tell you, when I was the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, I had over 3,500 students to be responsible for. And the first thing I asked my chancellor, are we really going to keep all these students and faculty get together? But as time grew, and we integrated the natural sciences with the social sciences and the humanities and the arts and the physical sciences, wow, did we weave a beautiful tapestry in the College of Arts and Sciences. Unfortunately, it's now been restructured. But it was the love. It was the integration. It was the faculty willing to cross lines that kept them in their offices or in their labs and began to work together and collaborate together and we were producing this, a very different kind of student. So Dr. Carver was the same way. He was not limited to a single discipline or the department that he led. So I will not go over all of the stories that you hear every year about his accomplishments, and they were many, about crop rotation to improve the soil. Well, today we might call that climate change. We might call that something else, or alternative crops for farmers, hundreds of products. And no, he didn't, he didn't discover peanut butter, as most of us like to think, but Lord knows he certainly laid the groundwork for that. He was very much external inside his office and outside of his office in the community. So he was a master teacher. In other words, he went beyond the call of duty to assure that his students and his community were learning, were being supported. Today we call that community engagement. I was struck by Dr. Carver's mobile classroom called the Jessup Wagon, named after a Tuskegee donor. I can just see him and his students in his, what we call now, a mobile unit, riding out to impoverished farmers in mule-drawn, in a mule-drawn and movable wagon over the weekends, explaining to people how to farm better, how to grow better crops, how to improve food quality and preserve their foods to be more successful economically. So now, what do we call that? He and his students, we call that active learning. So there's really nothing new under the sun. Dr. Carver had it all together. So I'm, I, I, I'm just in awe of the things that you're doing here when I perused your website, all of the centers, the collaborations, the cross-fertilizations are so exciting and so necessary for today's student. So as we commemorate this life and this legacy of Dr. George Washington Carver, we've been left with so much. Like many who have made an impact on humankind, he was just an ordinary guy with ordinary circumstances at that time. But a guy who had a big dream, who allowed himself to create and to be recreated every day, day by day, layer by layer, circumstance by circumstance. His identity kept emerging, and that's how we must do 
as be as well. He had many years to reflect. He was in deep thought, wonder, curiosity. He collaborated well, and he sacrificed a lot. He had the heart to give, a heart to help, and a passion to keep going in spite of. I wonder what he would think of our society today. We're certainly on the fast track in this world. We're in the midst of super biotechnology, super agriculture, complex global economy, artificial intelligence, drones, driverless cars, and the list goes on. I wonder what his message would be to us this morning. I'd like to stretch my mind and leave you with just a couple of thoughts. I believe he would say to our students, be strong, be brave, do not fear, anticipate some challenge, begin to see deeply where others just look. Let go of your fears, lessen historical self-doubt and judgment. Stop downplaying talents and achievements. Study hard for learning's sake and without ceasing. To our faculty, he just might say, find your passion. Reach far beyond the traditional classroom or the traditional laboratory. Mentor students in a way that they can take your place. Learn to withstand criticism. Dr. Carver was criticized, and yet he kept going. To our staff and our persons that keep all of us going, he might say, you're the front lines. You bring value like no other. Every job is important. And to our administrators, Dr. Morris, he just might insist that we go ahead and file those patents because they'll keep our university afloat. And to all of us, thank you for your celebration, he might say. But celebrate me more as you live life and do your best to project light onto the world and to the lives of others. He might say that we're all leaders and are all called to do the same wherever, however, and whenever circumstance finds itself. Students, staff, professors, administrators, no one is excluded from advancing new visions for human society. And finally, Dr. Carver just might invite us to the Missouri Botanical Gardens to the Carver Garden, where people can read about his inspiration, read about his speeches. They might go to the reflecting pool where there are benches and small, there's a small amphitheater surrounding the water for relaxation. He might say, take a moment to observe the viburnums and the hydrangeas where his life size statue stands, but he wouldn't want you to stand too long gazing at him. He would say, don't spend too much time at this spot. Spend your time at the bench with a student, with a faculty colleague, with someone from North Carolina A&T to think about life, to think about how best to manage, how best to collaborate, how to soar, how to take what you have and add to it, layer by layer, and change the world for good. And then, live your best life. And after you do that, die. Die placidly, with the peace of knowing that your light has shown, that you have dreamed dreams that are bigger than your degree. That's okay, we're all gonna die. I'll just wait and let us get a good laugh. That struck a chord, Dr. Morris. Die placidly with the peace of knowing that your light has shown that you have dreamed dreams that are bigger than your degree or your position or your tenure, that you have helped someone along the way, that you have sought and fought for a greater cause, 
and that your living was not in vain. God bless you.